your purpose is not just to do some nice things and then move on in your life. Your purpose is to carry God's presence wherever you are and allow God's glory to descend in a region. We are called to be carriers of awakening. And if we're not that then we must find ourselves in a place where God can use us to the point where his presence overwhelms not a church, but overwhelms a region. Okay. We desperately need awakening in America. And we all say that, but the source of awakening is not out there it is the people of God. Listen, you want to talk about the darkness in America? You can talk about it all day long. But the source of awakening comes through the people of God. And look at me. The reason the world is dark is because the people of God are dark. You say, well, show that to me in the Bible. If my people, I will heal the land. So we need to stop yelling at the world. And we need to go deep in our relationship with God and say, God, what, what do you want to do with me as an individual? So there are patterns, processes, roads that are very common in the Bible and in history about how God works, how God does this. You say, well, God's unpredictable. No, he's really not. He says, I don't change. If you want to know how God is going to do something tomorrow, look at how God did something yesterday. I'm not saying that God is not different, that he's not a God of variety. He is. But the basic road to get there throughout the Bible and throughout history has been the same. So what does that road look like? Israel is sort of a marker it is a way that God speaks to us. They become a road map. How God dealt with Israel is how God deals with us. How God dealt with his people then is how God deals with his people now. And when you go into the book, one of the books of the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets, his name was not minor because his, his, his message wasn't as important, just minor because the books were shorter. We begin to see this, this process that, that God uses, and Israel will become a sign to the nations, but it will also be a sign to us. So the book of Zechariah is a series of visions that God will give to the prophet Zechariah. By the way, that's how God speaks. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through visions. He speaks to us through dreams. Okay, that's the language of God. If that's like, eh, no, no, I'm into that. I don't know, that's not really for me. It is for you because that's the language of God. That's how God talks. That's how he's talked throughout history. It hasn't changed. Just because we think it's weird or we've never experienced it before doesn't mean that God has changed his language. So, Watch this with me for just a moment. I, I just want to take you through this brief pathway, a road, a way to awakening. So we get to Zechariah chapter 12. And notice what he says. Israel is going to be a sign. Now just keep that in your mind. Israel is a sign to the nations then and now. This message concerning Israel came from the Lord. It's from God. Who is it from? Okay, so we know who's talking here, right? Who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundations of the earth, and formed the human spirit. Okay, so this is God talking. God says, I did it then, I can do it now. I'm like God. Look at somebody and say, he's God and you're not. <laughs> Notice what he says. I'll make Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It's been that way throughout history. I'll make Jerusalem like an intoxicating drink that makes the nations stagger when they send their armies to besiege Jerusalem and Judah. Now, there's a key phrase that will happen throughout what Zechariah is going to say. It's these three words, on that day. Say that with me. Say it one more time. On what day? What day is that? <laughs> I 
Very good. Amazing. The first service did the very same thing. You guys are the smartest church in America. <laughs> On that day, I will make Jerusalem a movable rock. All the nations will gather against it to try and move it. Now, just get this in your mind, that they'll only hurt themselves. For I will begin to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So then what is going to happen is God is going to show First of all, how he's going to bring Israel back. Because the Bible is clear. Don't look at their government now. The Bible is clear. Understand with me, the Bible is clear. One day, all of Israel will acknowledge who Jesus is. Okay, th that's what the Bible says. And by the way, God did say, those, those that uh, bless you, I will bless, and those that curse you, I will curse. That's why we support Israel. That's why there's an, as an, an Israeli flag flying out uh, in the parking lot, because we believe that what God said, we believe, and he, you bless him. If I bless Israel, he'll bless me. Anybody need to be blessed of God, okay? So watch this with me. Three simple things. Number one. The first thing that begins to happen when God is going to start to awaken a people is the spirit of prayer and repentance. He says, then I will pour a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and on the people of Jerusalem. They will look on me, on Christ, whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him. Listen to me. This is not about yearning after the things that Jesus can give us, but yearning after him alone. Here, here, here's where the church in America is at, is that we want the gifts of God, but we don't want God himself. And so we will ask for things, but we're not really asking for him what awakening, awakening does is that it softens my heart to where I'm not really concerned about what he can give me. All those things are fine, and it's okay to ask for those things, but there is a place where you will come to in a relationship with God when you don't care about the things, you only care about him. And we move from seeking his hands of what he can give to seeking his face. Because remember, if you get him, you get everything that he has to offer. It is this mourning, it's this breaking, it's this idea of humbling ourselves before the Lord. And, and, and this, this brokenness was so great, he will go back and describe something that happened in history, the sorrow morning in Jerusalem on the day we liked the great morning for hated women in the Valley of Megiddo. What was that? That was when one of the most godly kings that ever led Israel was killed accidentally in battle. Josiah was eight years old when he took over the throne, and he was a man of God. He did what was right in contrast to many of the other kings. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he led that nation in purity, and he's accidentally killed, and they begin to mourn for him. And then it says all Israel will mourn for who? They look on him, not what he can give. Can I just tell you what God is trying to do with his people? If you call yourself a Christian, he's trying to get us to the place where our personal sins matter to us. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about somebody who's never known Jesus. I'm talking about those people that name the Lord, their attitude, their heart, their mind, their words, their habits, the things they watch, the things they say, the places they go. He, he's, he's trying to get us to a place where we're personally revived again to where, Lord, I just need you. When was the last time you prayed and said, God, I don't care about stuff. I just want you. I just want you. I don't care about reputation. I don't care what people say. I just want you. You see, when God begins to move upon people like that, you'll know that God is up to something. Because he's trying to move people toward himself. Now, now, what will happen as a result of that, what begins to take place? There's a second thing that starts to happen, and it's this thing called the spirit of holiness. Now, watch this. 
on that day, what day? On that day, on that day of brokenness, on that day of repentance, again, not for the world, for the body of Christ. On that day, when that begins to happen, a fountain will be opened up, an invisible fountain, a fountain that nobody knew was there, not a drip, not, not a little dribble, not just a small thing, but a fountain that bubbles up. He said a fountain will be opened for the people of Jerusalem. A fountain, what will it do? It will cleanse them from all their sins and impurity. Here it is again. And on that day, on that day of what? When, when, when people realize, not the world, when those that name the Lord as a personal Savior, when they realize it really does matter how I live. Look, look. You can pray all day long, but if your life is impure, you're not going to get an answer. You see, purity is the, is, the, is the way that God flows through us. And I'm not talking about holiness, not talking about perfection, okay, because nobody in the room is ever going to get there until we get to heaven. We're talking about a hunger for the purity of Jesus. And not holiness in the sense of how long your hair is or whether or not you, you're wearing a dress or pants. Not that stuff. Makeup, okay. Maybe we're beyond that by now. It's not external. It's the, it's the heart that God begins to deal with. I'll erase the idol worship. Oh, man. How many idols do we have within our lives? He says, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to remove it that even the names of the idols will be forgotten. God's going to bring us to a place where the stuff that troubled us, the stuff we couldn't conquer, the stuff that keep pulling us down, the hooks in our lives that kept dragging us down, God's going to bring us to a place where you're not even going to remember what it was. You're going to be so free. And there's going to be a level of victory that we've never known or experienced before. See, see watch this. I'll remove from the land both the false prophets, the source of, of this idolatry, and the spirit of impurity that came with them. And watch this. I'm going to bring that group to the fire, and I'm going to make them pure. I'm going to bring them through the fire. I'm going to make them pure. I'll refine them like silver and purify them like gold. Am I speaking French right now? Am I speaking a foreign language right now? Or do you understand that God wants to send the spirit of holiness through his church in America? They're going to call on my name, and then I get an answer. I will say, these are my people. And they'll say, the Lord is our God. Let me show you how important this was to God. So if you go back to chapter 3 in the book, you have Joshua, who is the high priest. He's the spiritual leader. And it says that this high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord. In other words, he's in the place of ministry. He's standing before God in his presence. And watch what happens here. Satan was there hmm, at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Joshua. That's the devil's job to accuse us. I would tell you something. There's a long list that the devil can accuse me of stuff. What about you? Something's the matter with my microphone. What about you? There's a long list of things that he can accuse. Anytime you're being accused or anytime somebody else is accusing you of anything, true or not, there's a source of that behind it. It's evil. It's demonic. Because that's all the devil can do. That's all he can do is he can accuse us, accuse us, accuse us. But watch what God does here. God says, I reject your accusations. This is important. I, the Lord, reject your accusations. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. And then he talks about Joshua being like a burning stick. You throw a stick in the fire, you leave it in there long enough, it's going to get burned up. And what God does is that he pulls it out of the fire before it's destroyed. You want to know what some of us are in this room? We are like a stick that's been pulled out of the fire before we were destroyed. As a matter of fact, some of you are in the fire right now, and I'm telling you what God is going to do for you. He's going to pull you out of that fire before the fire destroys you. The fire is going to destroy the thing that's trying to destroy you. Now, 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 now listen. 
Now look, his clothing was filthy as he stood there before the angel. So the angel said to the others, take off his filthy clothes. This man's already ministering. This man's already standing in the presence of God, but he's not clean. So God said, I'm going to take off those filthy clothes. Turning to Joshua, he said, see, I've taken away your sins, and now I'm giving you these fine new clothes. And look what else God will do here. Then he said, they should place a clean turban on his head. What is God going to do? He's going to purify the mind. He's going to purify the motives. He's going to purify the thinking. He's going to purify our crazy ways, the thoughts that we have about God and about everything else. This is what God is getting ready to do. And listen, who can endure it? Because you've got to be willing. On that day, God says, I'm going to send a spirit of holiness. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room are willing to say, God, I want the fire of purity to sweep through my life. God, I want you to burn up everything that's not of you. Anybody willing for that in the room? Because it's coming. Prophet Malachi said, who could endure it? He talks about God coming and everybody claps, but he says, who's really going to be able to endure the fire of God's purity? Because God will bring things up in our life and say, what about that? Say, what about that? What about that? What about that? I say, oh God, give it all to me. Why? What would, be, what would be the goal of that? I, I need to ask you one more question. Are, let me ask it to you again. Are you really willing for that? Or, or, or we, got a, we got a hand with Jesus over here and a hand in the cookie jar of the world over here. They don't mix. And one of the reasons why people become so frustrated in church, serving God or whatever, is they're trying to straddle the fence. You want to know what God is looking for? He's looking for some people that are so totally sold out, they don't care what anybody else says. They've dived head first into the things of God, and whatever God wants is that's what they're going to do. Well, why, why would it matter? Because here's the third thing that happens when there's a prayer and repentance, when there's this holiness thing. You get the spirit of life and power on that day. On what day? The sources of light will no longer shine. What, what's he talking about? He says no more natural light. There's going to be supernatural light. You're going to see things you've never seen before. But, but listen, when I light up, my responsibility is to carry this into a world that has no knowledge of what this is. Yet there'll be continuous day. How's that going to happen? It's God's light. Only the Lord knows how this could happen. Yeah. There'll be no normal day and night for evening time. It will still be light on that day. On what day? Watch this. Life-giving waters will flow out of Jerusalem. And, and, and this is interesting, half toward the Dead Sea. If you've ever been to the Dead Sea before, it's, it's you know, you can float in it. It's got muck and mi so much minerals you can't drink it. God said, I'm going to purify everything that's not pure. Life-giving water. Can I just tell you what America needs right now is life-giving water. It's muddy. Listen to me. The church is muddy. not clean. God said, I'm going to send life-giving water. Come out of Jerusalem flowing continuously. The Lord will be king over all the earth. And on what day? There'll be one Lord. And his name alone will be worshipped. Now, now, then he says this. Watch this. On that day. On what day? This is, a, this is kind of a weird scripture. Even the harness bells of the horses will be inscribed with these words. Even the animals will have inscribed on their bridles, holy to the Lord. Okay. And on that day, on what day? This is, this, this is weird. I'll tell you what it means. There will be no longer Canaanites in the house of God. Who was a Canaanite? Canaanite were the, were, were the opposers of Israel. They were idol worshipers. God said, I'm removing everything out that doesn't need to be there. Okay. 
Now, if you've ever been to Israel, and this is why Israel is a sign to the world of what God is doing, you understand that the largest fresh body of water is the Sea of Galilee. And most of the time, the Sea of Galilee is at a low level because Israel is a very arid country. They scrounge around for rain because by about the middle to the end of April, the rain quits and everything gets brown. doesn't start again until the fall and it's hot. There's no water. And for years, the Sea of Galilee is at a low level. And I just got this message the other day from our guide that we've used in Israel. I want you to see what God is doing right now, and it's a sign to the world. Maybe you've already heard that this Sea of Galilee is threatening to overflow the banks. Right now, we stand at only 70 centimeters before we fall over and have to open the dam at the southern end of the Jordan River. Look at it lapping on these stones here in Guinnessaw. We're very excited. As a matter of fact, now we're worried about what we're going to do um, if it overflows. How can we save the water? So Israel is pumping it as fast as they can so not to lose any of it. God has certainly blessed us with abundant rain and snow, and the snow hasn't even begun to fill up this lake. You know what this means? God is restoring this land. He's bringing back his immigrants. He's bringing back his Jewish people. And the sign of this abundant rain is what always accompanies these moves of God. Israel will be a sign to the nations. A sign of awakening around the world is happening right now in the nation of Israel. Okay, It's a sign, church. The other night, on Wednesday night, we're, we're prayer walking Newton, right? And I have to tell you how important prayer walks are and, and why we need to do this because the Scripture said, every place that the sole of your foot treads upon that, is a, that have I given you. And so we pray, and we do the circle around downtown Newton, up by the government um, office and the police station, all the way down to Highway 16 and back around. We split up into two groups, and then we meet back in the center at the old courthouse. One of our intercessors found this a couple of weeks ago, right, right by where we pray at. Beneath this marker is the old courthouse well. This is significant. Okay, It's a sign. Dug in 1842, sealed in 1908. During those years, it was the public water supply for Newton. Somebody told me before church that in years gone by, at this public water supply, the horse and buggies would be lined up forever as people were waiting to get the water. Can I tell you what God is getting ready to do? He's going to pour out His Spirit, and people are going to be lined up for miles waiting for God to fill them with His divine presence. It's a sign! I can't tell you where this is located at, but... About a month ago, I preached to a gathering. I was in the cafe over here, and those people were in a different location somewhere else in a different part of the world. That's, that's me on the screen there. I'm over here in the cafe. There were over 27,000 people that were at this gathering, and most of them don't even have a relationship with God. It's a very dangerous area. Over 24,000 of them responded to Christ. There were over 100 tumors that disappeared off from people's bodies and hundreds of healings because they go through all the documentation. This is not like, okay, they raise up a hand. Okay, that person. No, it takes them days to document everything that happens in these events. God's doing it around the world, but I believe God wants to do it right here in, a, in America. We are on television in foreign nations, and now 
the views of the program, they take the morning worship service and translate it. There are nearly 6 million people every month that are now watching. Here, here's a little clip of it. Yesu tera shukr ho. Worship team, aapka shukriya aur baaki sab log jo church mein hain, aap sab ka shukriya ada karna chahunga. You didn't know I could speak that language, did you? Bohut si chizin church aane se rok leti hain. Jaysay kuch log bimar pad jate hain, kuch kaam pe chale jate hain. Kuch log shahar se dur hote hain, si chizin hume church se dur rakhti hain. Aur Amerika ke log mahine mein Austin ek ashariya satais baar church jate hain. And every month there are testimonies of people. Here's what I believe. I believe a five-year-old, because of what God is doing, could preach and God would do it. Because it has nothing to do with us and everything with what God is trying to do around the world. That's why we're not ashamed to say give. Look, just since January, just since January of this year, we've given to Ukraine, we've given to, to get uh, to, to go against human trafficking. We've given to build wells. We've given here in this city. We've given over $90,000 just since January. This is why your giving is important. This is why the tithe is important, okay? You, you don't get to participate in, in what God is doing around the world without giving. Okay, we are not ashamed to say you can give because we're giving a lot of it away just since January. Okay. And then, listen, and then, over the last number of weeks, and this is why we want you to go to the website and, and go to the place where it says share your story. Over the last number of weeks, there are many people that have been healed. Some of you in this room, but people don't know about it. We want people to know because it encourages other people's faith. This is just one of those stories. About three years ago, I had a major eye accident. Uh, I was supposed to lose my eye, so uh, we decided to go the route to putting it back together. And well, five surgeries later, uh, uh, I got sight in my eye about 2050 with a correctable lens. But about three weeks ago, I woke up on Tuesday morning and I was completely blind in that eye and uh, kind of freaked me out. Woke my wife up and told her exactly what was going on and she kind of made an appointment for me to an emergency appointment over at Greystone. Uh, got to Greystone, they said that I had a hemorrhage, blood hemorrhaging under my eye and that, that they thought that I was gonna lose the, the graft to the eye. The doctor said, we're gonna give it about six days, or, and then we want you to come back, and then we're gonna take a picture of the back of your eye, see if you have a tear in your retina, or, uh, you know, or a detached retina. And so, uh, I, that was on a Thursday, so Wednesday night prayer, I came in, and I didn't really say much to anybody, and I just sat in the back, and, and I was really thinking about you know, God, I, 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 I really need you to show up on this. And, uh, and I said, if you, you know, you kind of make a deal with God, you're sitting back there. I'm not, I'm just, I just need somebody to pray for me. And so uh, it was a Wednesday night, the Amanda was there and, and she called everybody down to the altar and uh, corporately. And we I went down to the altar and, and there was a guy named Lenny Duncan that was down there and we were praying over the names and then after we got done he just turned around and he laid his hands on my right eye which was the one that was, in, was uh, hemorrhaging and uh, he prayed a really kind of touching prayer for me because uh, of all those people then he had uh, growing up with eye, eyes you know went through operations and that kind of stuff and but that next morning I got in the car with my wife and I said hey you know Lenny prayed over my eye and, and, uh, and I, you know, I, I just really believe that we're going to get a good report so we went in there the doctor uh, took the picture of the back of the eye and uh, 
And he looked at it and he called me into his office and he said, look, uh, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> and anyway, the blood has stopped. Uh, I've got eyesight back. Uh, it's coming back slowly and uh, I can uh, see details now and uh, I really felt like God was in the room and it's just a, a miracle that when we pray corporately, God is in the midst of it. Stand with me right now. Come on. Here's what I believe. That God is attempting the Bible he's attempting to, to use people but the Bible says he his eyes roam to and fro across the earth seeking for those individuals whose hearts are right toward him the dove the Holy Spirit is looking for a place to land Just as Noah released the dove out of the boat and it looked for a place to land, God has released the Holy Spirit across the world. And the Holy Spirit is looking for a place to land. He's looking for a man that will open up his heart and say, God, whatever it takes, I'm here. He's looking for a woman. He's looking for a teenager. He's looking for a child. As the dove looks for a place to land, he's looking for churches where he can land. But let me tell you what that, that requires out of you and me. And I'm going to ask you a question, and don't, don't answer this question immediately. Are you willing, no matter the cost, no matter what you have to do, no matter what it will require you to let go of. No matter what you have to do, does God have your yes for the dove to land? I hear people all over the place, oh, we got a great thing. Look, all this happened. It's great there. Look, let's, let's just be straight up with it. There's, there are signs of revival, but listen, that's not, don't, don't, don't use that term anymore just because you felt the presence of God somewhere and somebody looked spiritually excited. I'm not going to say something's revival. Now, there are signs of it, and we're not going to diminish it because the Bible says don't despise the day of small things. <laughs> okay? So you say, well, it wasn't the blowout I was looking for. Yeah, but is it a sign? <laughs> don't despise the day of small things. But I'm not going to call a good worship service revival. Maybe there's a spirit of revival. But what I'm after is what happened in history with the first great awakening with Jonathan Edwards, the second great awakening with George Whitfield and Charles Finney, the Hebrides revival where there was so much power on the island, off the island of Scotland in the Hebrides, that people were on outside in the ditches rolling under conviction. You say, well, that's a little odd. I'm going to tell you what. America's backwards and upside down right now. That kind of move of God flips us upside right again. Okay, That's what I'm after. That's what I live for. That's what I think about. That's what I pray about. But you have to answer the question as a teenager, as a young man, as a young lady, as a mother, as a father, as a husband, as a wife, as a man, as a woman, as a person in this room. You have to say, God, 
am I willing to am I willing to give it all up if I can get Jesus? Lord, if I can get you, take it all. If I can just get him, just him. Because if I can get him, I'll get everything that comes along with him. But I don't want anything that he has to offer if I ultimately cannot get him. You've got to answer the question. You've got to answer the question. Is anybody willing for the river just to flow through you unhindered? Okay. Because remember, power, supernatural power, is con connected to personal purity and holiness. Pray all day long. But if I'm not willing to lean into the purity of Jesus, then I'm plugged up. And when Isaac had no water, he needed water. It's in Genesis 26 when he needed water for his family, for his animals, for his workers, hundreds of them, thousands of animals. He didn't go looking for something new. He redug the wells of his father that had been plugged up by Philistine mud for dozens of years. And we don't need something new, folks. We just need to unplug the well that's already been dug. And when we get rid of the mud, we can access the water. Slip your hands toward the Lord right now. Come on.